Snowflake's efficient design makes it an economical platform, but what I hope to demonstrate today is that optimal usage requires some best practices. I made it a point to use the term guardrails in my title, so let's begin with them. Guiding principles usually get the most attention, and they can steer you towards the right technology, but they're not always safe on their own. Guardrails help you use tech in a cost-effective way. Here's an example of each. Guiding principles offer high-level advice, while guardrails provide specific methods to improve behavior. One of the cloud's biggest advantages is scalability, but having easy access to an unlimited set of resources is also one of the primary causes of overspending. We all know how this ends. Here's the motivation behind this presentation. To prevent runaway spending, we need to understand two things, how costs are calculated and what guardrails are available to help us stay on budget. Instead of talking about all Snowflake charges today, I'll focus on just the biggest line item, compute costs. There are two ways to pay for Snowflake services. The on-demand method is like asking a waiter for the check after you eat your meal. And the capacity option is like going out for fast food. It's cheaper, but you have to pay up front. Since capacity discounts vary based on the size of your commitment, I'll just use on-demand pricing to make comparisons during this talk. A Snowflake credit is a unit of measure, equivalent to one hour of usage by one virtual server node. You may have seen a table like this before, which shows both nodes and credits increasing by powers of two. So, when computing resources like CPU, RAM, and local storage double, your cost doubles too. The price per credit varies based on these four factors. Here are just a few examples to show how on-demand credit price varies by provider, region, and addition. Looking at just Azure, when you set up your Snowflake account, you can select from many regions. I mapped the non-government U.S. regions to make them easier to see. The good news for Azure users is that Snowflake prices do not vary within these four U.S. regions, so you don't need to select a region based on price. You do, however, need to decide which edition to use. The standard edition is the base package, great for startups and students. Enterprise adds several features to the standard edition, which are useful for large organizations. Business Critical adds several security features to the Enterprise Edition. And a virtual private snowflake is the Business Critical Edition running in its own environment, isolated from all other snowflake customers. Now I'll show an example of why guardrails are needed. First, an analogy. If I wanted the lowest possible electricity bill, I wouldn't use motion detectors that eventually turn my lights off after they haven't sensed motion for several minutes. Instead, I would manually turn the lights on when I enter a room and then manually turn them off immediately while I exit. Intuitively, a manual method seems like it would be best for controlling compute clusters too. When I need to run a query, I can manually click the Resume button to wake up a cluster. I can then run my query and when it completes, I can immediately put the cluster to sleep. Billing for compute is on a per second basis, but there is also a one minute charge whenever a cluster wakes up, and this throws a wrench into using the manual method. I tried to limit my spend to just the few seconds that it took my query to run, but I had to pay for one minute of usage. If another user performs the same manual resume, run, suspend method, they will incur a one minute charge too, even though their query only ran for a few seconds. A bigger problem is that we are double charged for this overlapping period. If another user does the same manual method, they will also have a one minute expense and create another double charge. Now let's look at how automated features can help. 
When creating a new cluster, you can turn on the Auto Resume and Auto Suspend options and set a low Suspend After value. When a user submits a query, the sleeping cluster automatically wakes up. After the query completes, if there is no activity on the cluster for 60 seconds, it will automatically go back to sleep. However, if another query gets submitted before the auto suspend timeout, it can run immediately. And the timeout period gets reset after the second query ends. The same is true for a third query. And we pay for this contiguous period of uptime, but there is no double charging. So a good guardrail would be to use the automated features to wake clusters up and to put them back to sleep. Here's another example of how the one-minute charge makes operations less intuitive. Say our query runs for nearly 60 seconds on a one-node extra small cluster. Since we use the smallest cluster available, our cost will be very small for this query. If we wanted our query to run faster, we could use a two-node cluster, and it might complete in about half the time. So, our cost remains the same, right? Not if ours was the only query running. Our cost would include the remaining idle time, so our query would be twice as fast, but it would also cost twice as much. Our cost will go up even higher if the auto-suspend timeout is greater than one minute. In fact, the default setting is 10 minutes, so if a cluster is not very busy, then small queries can be unnecessarily expensive. So a good guardrail would be to frequently analyze the amount of idle time that runs up your cost and lower the auto-suspend timeout when warranted. Here's an illustration of that concept. When a cluster is busy running lots of queries, there is very little idle time. But idle times are much longer on a less busy cluster, and this is when the auto-suspend timeout should be lowered. Here's an example of when your intuition can fail you. You run a query on a large cluster when it's not busy so that it won't cost a lot. Your query did run quickly, but since yours was the only query running, you also have to pay for all the idle time. And unfortunately, the auto-suspend timeout is still set to the 10-minute default, so your 7-second query consumed over an hour of compute. What if instead you used a one-node cluster, with its timeout set to one minute? This significant difference in cost illustrates the point that unbusy clusters with high timeouts can cost you a lot of money. Now we'll look at some other cluster considerations. When I first tested Snowflake, I ran the exact same query on different sized clusters to see how size affects speed and cost. For example, going from an extra small to a small cluster decreased runtime by a good 42% and increased cost by only 17%. Here are the other percent changes. This test showed me that I hit the sweet spot when I ran on an extra large cluster because the runtime was almost cut in half, but the cost went up only 10%. Using even larger clusters for this query proved to be cost ineffective. With Snowflake, you can have multiple clusters access the same data, which helps to prevent resource contention. Companies often assign clusters based on internal departments because this makes it easy to allocate costs. However, this can lead to running several unbusy clusters for teams that don't run many queries. A better way can be to assign clusters based on workload type and size. Here you see multiple clusters for loading data into Snowflake, for transforming it, and for querying it. So this leads us to another guardrail, because busy clusters are more cost-effective. Centralizing the responsibility of cluster management is important, so you should put guardrails around who can create them, 
who can modify their settings, like the auto suspend timeout, and who can grant access to them. Another good guardrail is to use parameters to automatically stop queries that are taking too long to execute. Now we'll look at how Snowflake's built-in monitoring feature can help control costs. Say we have multiple clusters grouped by workload and we consider some of them to be priority clusters because they serve important production needs and the others are non-priority used for tasks like research and testing. We can set up an account level monitor that will notify folks when a quota of say 6,000 credits has been consumed for the month. This will include credits consumed by all clusters except for those used by serverless functions. We can set up a monitor that considers only credits consumed by the priority clusters. If two of the non-priority clusters consume a total of 1,500 credits, they will automatically be suspended once their active queries end. And for the other non-priority cluster, we can have a notification sent out if it consumes 450 credits. And if it consumes 500 credits, all active queries will be aborted and the cluster will be suspended immediately. Each cluster can have only one cluster level monitor, but each monitor can have multiple actions. For my single non-priority example, we can set its quota to 500 credits then notify folks when it gets to 90% of this threshold and suspend it immediately once it hits 100%. The two suspend actions are really the only ones that automatically cap spending. The notify only action requires human intervention. So the question is, who will be responsible for taking action when notifications are sent? For the account level monitor, only account admins can be notified. But for each cluster level monitor, up to five non-admins can be notified. A necessary guardrail will be to have someone react to each alert from notify only monitors because they do not suspend activity. My last topic is about allocating a cost to each query by using the granular usage data that Snowflake provides for billing transparency. Costs are computed based on cluster uptime, not based on query runtime, so we'll have to do some math. During this first hour, two long queries ran, plus half of another query, so the consumed credits have to be allocated proportionally. Similarly, during the second hour, credits consumed while queries were running and while the cluster was idle need to be spread proportionally. As I mentioned earlier, sharing a cluster across several teams often makes sense to keep the cluster busy, but shared clusters need to rely on query tags to assign costs to the appropriate team. Each query is automatically tied to one user ID, and this is helpful, but you can also have queries tagged with other metadata like the department name or the job title of the submitter. I'll demonstrate this with an example of an admin creating a new user account. If the query tag parameter is populated when it's created, then every query this user submits will be tagged with whatever key value pairs are included here. But what happens when halfway through the year, this employee moves to a different department, but an admin is not notified to change the user's query tag values? When we chart this user's activity for the whole year, all of his costs are incorrectly allocated to his old department. Here's another scenario. Say the admins don't want to include query tag metadata when new user accounts are created. When you need to report costs by department, each query's user ID can be used to read an external HR file to obtain the current department name. The HR file that I access has one set of values for each employee, so there's no opportunity to obtain a user's department based on a query's run date. You can only get their current department. So now all the costs are incorrectly allocated to the new department.
Here's an example solution to such an issue. A daily job can execute a script that alters user accounts so that they contain current HR values every day. This would enable each submitted query to be tagged with the HR data that was current on that day. And then allocations can be calculated correctly for each month. I hope these few examples make a persuasive case for implementing guardrails and monitoring in your Snowflake environments.